Would you join me? Let's pray. Lord God, no matter where we are right now, you are there. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, that our ears would hear, our soul would be ready. Our Lord, we we still ourselves before you. Help us know more and more the joy and the truth of Easter. For your glory and our good, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if we think about the last week, this has been Holy Week, and what a particularly strange Holy Week for us as a world, not just as a church. Last Sunday uh, it was Palm Sunday, where we remember that Jesus entered into Jerusalem to great fanfare, to the people, the crowd, crying out, Hosanna, here is the one who has come to save us. And then we go through to Maundy Thursday, where Jesus uh, celebrates a meal, the Passover meal with his disciples, which we remember in Holy Communion, which we've had this morning, that he has this meal with his disciples to point to a greater sacrifice than what happened for the people of Israel in Egypt. And then he's betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes through a judicial process which is corrupt, who uh, charges him as guilty even though he is innocent. And on Good Friday, Tom reminded us of why we call it good. Why is a day where Jesus, God himself, dies and crucified in the most shameful way possible? Why do we call that good? And it's because God has done everything he can so we can know him and be known by him. And then we sit. And between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, it is always awkward. For those of us who follow Jesus, it is a dark and reflective and a tricky space. Because while the woes around us will celebrate, we, we sit and we wait for Sunday. Because on Sunday, we, we know that the, the cross doesn't get the final word. Death doesn't get the final say, but an empty tomb and resurrection power and God get the final say. That there is no night that is too dark that the sun won't shine. That there is no cave too dark and full of despair that God can't bring hope into. And so we remember the story of Good Friday before we enter into Easter Sunday. That in Luke 23, as Jesus is on the cross, it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. On Friday we remember that it was dark and God died. And as I've been preparing for for this service and this Sunday, I've been praying a lot, I guess, because Easter Sunday says something into the times we're in right now. In a time of a global pandemic, Easter Sunday has a truth which is so important to declare and to own in our heart. We live in anxious times, don't we? And even before COVID-19 was on the scene, anxiety was high in our culture, in our church, in our world, in our lives. Anxiety was here and present well before COVID-19. And anxiety has negative effects on people's behaviours. And I want to kind of unpack some of them with you this morning because what we don't know, we can't work against. And so some of these effects, you may even think of examples of yourself, how you've done these in the last few weeks. See, anxiety uh, is repressive, anxiety is infectious, and anxiety makes us reactive. It makes us repressed, infectious, and reactive. First of all, uh, anxiety is repressive. The the literal word anxiety means to to talk about the throat and to be pressing it together. It, It talks of being strangled. And for those of us that struggle with anxiety, we we know that feeling, don't we? That the word anxiety comes from the Greek god Anarche, who was the god of constraint who ruled over slavery. And that in the ancient world, slaves would have uh, rings around their throat that were called anarches to to symbolize that you are confined, you are oppressed, you are a slave, you are constrained. 
And what anxiety does to us is it treats us like a slave. It takes us by the throat and it chains us. It limits our thinking. We, we become, you know, we have funnel vision. We lose our capacity to learn. We replace curiosity with a demand for certainty. It floods our nervous system, doesn't it? Anxiety. It just, it floods us. We see red. And it prompts in us a desire for a quick fix. It's hard to be reflective when anxiety is high. Anxiety is repressive, but it's also infectious. Anxiety actually connects us to one another. If you've ever been at a family dinner and one person either is visibly anxious or expresses verbally anxiety, it spreads across the whole table, doesn't it? Or if you've been in a meeting. Or a great example, a very clear example, is what happens in our supermarkets right now. Anxiety is infectious. And so when we walk past you know, the cans or the milk or the toilet paper, and even though we may have enough at home, we see that the shelves are bare and we think, oh, maybe I need to get some. Because there's that anxiety in the air which infects our mind and our heart. Anxiety is repressive, it's infectious, and also it causes us to be reactive. There is an automatic response to anxiety. We use words like fight, flight, or freeze. Uh, Some other words I've heard are, in anxiety, people also don't just freeze or fight, they tend and befriend, which are um, some new categories in that space. There's an automatic response And my hope is by doing some some practical teaching of what anxiety does to us, it makes us more aware as as people of God what's going on in our inner world in these times. Because we can feel quite repressed right now, can't we? We can feel constrained and confined. We can feel like there's just anxiety in the air and it's infectious when we're going for a walk, we're getting our exercise, and and we look at people and, and we go, do I engage? Don't I engage? Can I smile? What do I do? And it makes us reactive. We buy things because we think, what if it runs out? And I've been looking to a lot of different faith leaders at this time to see how they're describing this moment, this ever-expanding crisis. And the question that's being asked is, how does God see this moment? This doesn't come as a surprise to God. And let me be clear, uh, the coronavirus is not uh, sent by God. This isn't God's doing. This is a work of evil and of sin. This is a virus which is spreading. This is not God's plan. But I do believe that God can use this moment, that God can work all things for his good, even the things which are awful. And there's a, there was this evocative moment a few weeks ago as Pope Francis was preaching uh, to an empty courtyard where normally pilgrims would meet. And he used these words, and he used this metaphor to describe our moment. He says this, For weeks now it has been evening. The darkness has gathered over our square, our streets and our cities. It has taken over our lives, filling everything with a deafening silence and a distressing void. That stops everything as it passes by. We feel it in the air. We notice it in people's gestures. Their glances give them away. We find ourselves afraid and lost. The, the metaphor, the image... I'm hearing people use to describe this time, and I think it's accurate, is that night has come. That the metaphor for the world right now is that we are in a night. And there is a a spiritual work that occurs in the night. We're in a really strange time in the world where time is becoming warped, isn't it? And that sometimes happens at night. We don't know how long this virus will be around. And it's amazing, a lot of the the markers we use to measure the year have gone. And the joke I've heard most uh, often during this time is people saying, I don't even know what day of the week it is. Have you made that joke? I've made that joke. Because we've lost the markers. We, we don't have sport on a Saturday. We don't have movies at the theatre and things are being just thrown into chaos. And there's this 24-hour news cycle and we're in the night time. And there is an opportunity in the night. Because what God is going to do during this season, my hope and prayer is that we come through this being stronger as people of God. And if you're watching for the first time, and this is maybe your first time interacting with faith, we're so excited you're here. And I hope this message speaks to you really clearly. Because we need to remember, before COVID-19 was on the scene, things were not okay in our world. It's amazing how sometimes we can get so focused on the moment. But before, 
things were not okay. On your screen, screen right now, there's going to be a picture from Hong Kong. This is a tweet by Shaheen Vali. And on this graffiti, it says these words, we can't return to normal because the normal that we had was precisely the problem. We can't go back to how things were because honestly, there were parts of how things were that were the problem. That greed was normal. That selfishness was rampant. That the way we were treating our planet was cruel. That we would uh, expose our, our planet to such risk by our greed. That we wouldn't say no. That the way we would treat people and use people and not treat them as divine beings but as uh, things to use, as tools, as objects. We can't return to normal because the normal that we had was the problem. And as this time, as, as different restrictions have been put on us, we're finding it can be uncomfortable. That as a thin veneer of, uh, of control is taken from our lives, we're kind of realising that our life and our world is out of whack. And so we want to reframe this moment because night has a purpose. There is a renewing work that God does at night. First of all, we, we sleep at night, generally, and sleep is a gift from God. And so this time, many of us are just getting to rest, which is actually a good thing. And if you're finding that you're busier now than before, that's a choice. That is a choice. And I understand for some workplaces you don't have much options, but this is a season of night where the world is being replenished. So rest. Uh, Nikolai Bodo, uh, a Russian Christian philosopher, says... Night is not less wonderful than day. It is lit by the splendor of the stars and it reveals things to us that by the day that the day does not know. Night is closer than day to the mystery of all beginning. There's an invitation from God during this time to attend to our inner world as things are stripped away and we're at home more and more. God might want to speak to you into the depths of your soul so that you can come through this stronger. Night is a time of inner work, of focusing, of concentrating without distractions. It's a time of inner spiritual work and prayer. We see this throughout the Bible, that at night the people of God gather in secret or gather in their homes, and God wants to say something, to do something in them. Uh, Ruth Haley Barton, talking about the time that we're in, says this, What are the works of God waiting to be revealed in me? and in each of us through this COVID-19 global crisis that affects each of us so intimately and personally. Even as we navigate the most significant crisis most have ever seen, we must not forget to ask this all-important question. What is happening right now, spiritually speaking, and how can we join God in it? In this time, God wants to do an inner work in your life. There might be some things which are out of whack, that aren't aligned, that what you value and what you're doing are not consistent. And God wants to do an inner work in your life right now. On your screen right now, there's a study that's been uh, occurring just in the last few months around the word prayer in Google searches. And in this time, there is a spiritual hunger that is awakening. As you see, as we get closer to March and when the COVID-19 crisis is becoming more and more impacting our world, people have been searching for prayer more. The night time, this season we're in, is a time of inner work, of prayer, of seeking God. The night is a time of inner work, but it's also a time of fleeing from slavery. We see this in the Passover, that the people of God, when they're in Egypt and they cry out to God in their slavery, God, save us, God works a miracle and they escape in the night. That they use the cover of darkness to escape from what enslaves them, what blinds them and binds them, and what addicts them. During this time right now, is there something in your life that you need freedom from, that you are a slave to, that brings anxiety and unhealth and despair to your world? Maybe the work of the night is that God wants to right now, in this time, when things are being stripped away, is to free you from that which which you are addicted to, which you are a slave to, are there slavery of, of lust, of money, 
Are there people that hold a sway on your life which is unhealthy? Are there unhealthy relationships? Is there a thirst for power in your life? And God is breaking that right now. As we go into this this season of night, is there something you're crying to God, saying, God, I need you to save me from this because I can't save myself. I've tried time and time again. I've failed time and time again. And this time right now, Easter 2020, in the midst of the coronavirus, God, would you save me? Would that be, is that your cry right now? Because in the night, God frees slaves. In the night, it's also a time of spiritual visions and visits. And we see time and time again that at night, God speaks to his people. That sometimes God will wake us up from our slumber to give us passion and energy and foresight. That's Samuel, one of the, the great Hebrew uh, prophets. He's a young man and God keeps on waking him up at night saying, Samuel, Samuel, and he doesn't know who the voice is. And it's God speaking to him. The shepherds, they're, they're tending to their sheep at night and the angels appear and say, salvation has come to you, a son is born, God is with us, go and find him. The night is a time of visions and of visits from God. When the space between earth and heaven are thinner. So during this time, maybe God will wake you up. Maybe God will speak to you. Maybe you have visions or dreams about what is happening and what God wants to do in your life and in our world. So be ready for that. Be ready for that, church. Let's welcome that. Let's pray for that. Let's seek that. Let's use this time because it's a time of night and God wants to speak to his people, to refine them, to prepare them. And also, night is a time to be strategic. Now, generally, night is a time to sleep. But in the ancient uh, uh, times and in the Bible, you've seen time and time again, the night is the time to get the troops ready for the battle that is to come. That In an age when there was no infrared, there was no night uh, vision goggles, that the people of God would get their armies ready and deployed and in the position so that when the dawn would come, they were ready to fight. And what I'm hearing and what I'm sensing and what I'm praying is that God is actually preparing his people so when the dawn comes, when the night is over, we're ready for the battle. That he's being strategic with his church. He's calling us to the quiet space with him, calling us to to prayer and to spend time with him and with key people and to be so intentional during this time. Because the dawn will come. How do we know when night is over? When dawn comes. And when we come to Easter, when we come to Easter Sunday, on Good Friday, the sun stops shining, night has come. But on Easter Sunday, we see in Luke 24 these words. On the first day of the week at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood before them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. How do we know when the night is over? When the dawn comes. And church, I don't know how long this will be. I don't. And my my guidance during this time isn't to set a date and say, well, by this stage, surely it will be over, because we don't know. It could be a few weeks. It could be a few months. This could be years. We, we don't know. But we do know that the night will end, that the sun will come. We are resurrection people that know that while there is Good Friday, where there are caves, there is darkness, there is night. We know that we hope for the dawn. We hope for the time when God revives the dead, when he shines his light into the darkness. We know the dawn will come. Christians are never prisoners, even if our circumstances look different. And earlier I spoke about what anxiety means, how it's it's slavery, how it grabs us by the throat. But the word for salvation in the Bible is the word yasha, where we get the name Jesus from. And this word salvation quite literally means open space. 
And what Jesus offers us this morning, what Jesus offers us every day, is to go from confined and slavery and trapped to an open space of salvation. To get through the night and to see the dawn and to see a glorious light and to know that we are not trapped anymore. This night will end. We don't know when, but it will. And when the dawn breaks, my hope is that as a church, that we are ready for what God has next for us. That we've used this time wisely. That doesn't mean that we're busy, but it means that we are wise. That when the night is over, we come back stronger, ready. We've done the inner work, that we have been freed from that which is enslaving us. That we have done the inner work and we know God, we know his voice, we know who he calls us to be, that we are closer to his presence, that we are closer to one another and we're ready for what is next, that we are ready to come back stronger. We're going to sing a new song now and it's called Do It Again and it's a song I would encourage you to sing throughout this week. Go on YouTube, go on Spotify, find the song, it's called Do It Again. We're going to sing it because what God has done before, God will do again. When God has brought resurrection before, he can do it again. And it has these strong words that your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. So I'll pray and let's sing. Lord God, in this space right now, we declare your resurrection power. Lord, we're in a season of night and there is a work you want to do in the night. And so we renew our commitment to you, knowing that you are the one who speaks, that you are good and that you are love and that you will take us through this time. Lord, we face it honestly knowing that things will be different. And there are, there are things to grieve during this time. Would you journey with us? You who have called us, would you save us and would you bring us to you more and more, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship.